If there's a name the demons fear, it's the name Jesus. If powers bow, they bow to the Lordship of our Christ. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are here today not just to celebrate a historical location. We are here to celebrate the reality of the revelation that Christ lives, not in a tomb, but in our hearts, in our lives, and amongst us. So lift those hands. Just worship the Lord for a few minutes. Today is a day where we give Him glory, we give Him honor, we give Him praise. He is the blessed one, the Savior of our lives. Father, we are so privileged today as a community, as a family, as members that have been set in the body of Christ to give you the praise, the glory, the honor, the exaltation. We are here today to admonish you, not only with your goodness and your mercy, but with songs and with hymns and with psalms. And we are here to sing with grace in our hearts because of the amazing work that you have done in each one of our lives. And what a privilege it is to bless your name, to worship you, to give you honor for the great salvation that you accomplished, secured for each one of us. Today we have hope that extends beyond the grave. Today we have the sense of victory, of triumph, because you conquered the grave and death. You removed the sting of death. What a privilege it is to know that despite our human weaknesses, our mortality, you gave us your blood so that we can live perfect under the covering of that blood. And we bless you for that. We bless you, we worship you. And if there be any amongst us here today that may not understand the reality, the revelation, the significance of your death and resurrection, May the, my eyes be opened to behold the wonders of that act that was done on the cross of Calvary and sealed in your resurrection. May our understanding be enlightened today, Father, so that we will truly appreciate what you have done for each one of us. We give you glory, we give you praise, we bless your name today. And Lord, if there be any amongst us that needs an intervention, a miracle, a breakthrough, an answered prayer. Maybe, Lord, some amongst us need a stone to roll away or need to be resurrected in a certain position that they are in. Father, you can do the impossible amongst us. So heal, deliver, release, set the captives free, break chains, deliver us from the bondages of the enemy. Lift us up, Lord, to that exalted position that we could live with you from a place called the right hand of the Father. We thank you for this time. Receive our dedication, receive our devotion, and receive all that we have presented to you thus far as a living and glorious sacrifice unto you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Give him glory. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Are you blessed? Yes. Are you blessed to come on a Friday? I know some of us will say, thank God it's Friday, but are you blessed to, to come on a Friday and just celebrate, celebrate, not simply the death of Christ, but the death that has, from the vantage point that we have, uh, this, whole, this whole aspect of the resurrection. You know, if Christ just simply died, we have no hope. But we, and if, if in this life only we had hope, then we would be the most miserable of people. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory in Christ Jesus. And because of that victory today, we can say, oh death, where is your sting? And oh grave, where is your victory? He conquered it 
so that we could be loosed from the fear of death and the grave. And, 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 and while we may expire or, 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 or transition from a physical body, we will always live in his presence, never be to be separated from him. What a hope. You know, we, today is not about black tea and hot cross buns. Today is not about pickled fish, and I like it. I like it. Today is not about Easter eggs and all the other commercial things that append itself to some significant religious um, occasions in the history of the Christian calendar. Today is about celebrating and triumphantly celebrating uh, our salvation. Now, salvation is not that we were just saved to go to heaven. That's not salvation. Salvation is that we were saved to be reconciled to the family of God again, where the spirit of adoption has been given to each one of us, so much so that that spirit cries out from within us, deep within us, Abba, Father, which simply means that God is now my father and I'm his child. And that salvation brought us back into that legal position, that legal position where we are now sons and daughters or children of the Most High God. That's salvation. And with that comes certain benefits if you belong to a significant family, like the family uh, who, you know, whose father is the creator of all things. And the benefits for us are that we are supposed to be heirs and joint heirs with Christ over everything that the Father has given us. Some of us have not experienced that reality because we, our mortality so often robs us of that reality. But my prayer for you is that you'll come to realize that in this life, in this life, we can start to acquire and enjoy all the benefits of our salvation. We are not here for what God can give us. We are simply here for who he is first. Okay, we're not here for handouts first. We're here to celebrate his amazing goodness. You see, I've already preached my sermon, now I can hand over. <laughs> but, um, but I wanted to emphasize that. And, and so this is a very special weekend for all of us. And, and you know, well, it's a good time to take a holiday, uh, but the holiday must become a holy day. Uh, and it's a good time to rest, but our rest must be in Shiloh, which, simply, which also means the place of rest, even though it's personified to become the person of rest. And so Shiloh moments are that God has built a bridge of peace for us, a bridge that brings us to peace, and we now operate like Samuel in a place called Shiloh, which means a place of rest, and we rest in the Lord. So in the midst of great, great anxieties and traumas and stresses in the world, we must learn how to rest. We must learn how to rest in him and find the peace that passes all understanding. And, um, and so we're, we're very, very thankful today. But today, um, God saved me from preaching saved our pastors from preaching, and he sent an angel to preach to us. Okay. I sent one, and I learned that uh, Pastor Randolph and Renee and their family would be visiting with us this Friday and spending this weekend here in Kauteng. And I said, well, if you're doing that, I'm celebrating an anniversary, so you come and preach. <laughs> you come and preach, so... so He's going to share the word of the Lord with us. They come from Durban. They're very senior sons in our global family of churches. They do a sterling work. work. They've also got their own family of churches within the Gate Global family. And uh, Randolph is an amazing teacher of God's word. He, pre he teaches line upon line, precept upon pre precept. And he knows how to, to put the pieces together. So it's my privilege to welcome him to share the word of the Lord with us. Put, our, put your hands together for Randolph Barnier.
Amen. Wonderful for me to be with you on this Easter weekend. Thank you, Pastor Thamo and Marolin, for the opportunity to share God's word. Um, it's always a humbling privilege to share God's word, particularly at this platform, and which I take very, very, very seriously. So I thought I was coming on a break, but I would prefer to give my father a break, <laughs> as it were. But because we love God's word, um, and we are called to communicate truth, it's always a, a great privilege whenever occasions present themselves to speak God's word to God's people. And particularly on days like this, occasions like this weekend and Easter weekend, um, simply a marvelous time for the church to reflect on some of the fundamentals of our faith, some of the core issues, bedrock issues that garrison and anchor our trust and our whole relationship with God sets very determined hope for the future so that we can live in absolute confidence in the present time. And so I want to share this morning with us on the Lordship of Christ. And I want to kick off by reading some scriptures relative to the death of Christ because it's Good Friday, the day in which supposedly, not the day literally, but the occasion that we choose to stop and to reflect on the fact that he died. Everyone say he died. Amen. It's a fundamental, it's a bedrock issue. Christ did die. Jesus Christ died for our sins. It's an absolute, an absolute critical uh, truth to factor into your understanding of doctrine and to know all of what this death has secured for, for you and I. How many people are grateful he died? Amen? Um, and in recent days, the Lordship of Christ has featured very prominently in my thinking and in the life of our church, um, but it's been a source of tremendous provocation to my spirit, a source of tremendous challenge to my faith, and I know that this word will inspire and challenge you equally. Amen? I'm ready for the word of the Lord. Amen? Now, in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, it says the following, Hebrews 2 and verse 9. I'm reading from the New American Standard. But we do see him who was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. How did Jesus taste death? Everyone say, by the grace of God. Even the Son of God himself fulfilled the will of his Father through the economy of grace. He himself could not function outside of being empowered by the sufficient grace of God. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he had a momentary weakness when he said, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But in the very next breath, he inclines his spirit to obey the Father's will. Nevertheless, everyone say nevertheless. Not my will, but yours be done. I believe that's the moment in which a huge download of grace kicked into the Son of God to endure the suffering, the rigors of the terrible death by crucifixion that he would have to go through. Grace allows you to endure. Grace allows you to experience much. Grace allows you to go through much in fulfilling the purposes of God for your life. Even Jesus, the Son of God, tasted death through no other means, yet through the grace of God. If the Son of God needed grace, how much more you and I? If he needed grace to die, how much more do you and I need 
grace to live in the culture of obedience unto death. Because he became obedient unto death. Philippians 2 says, even the death of the, of the cross. And whenever the will of God for your life and for my life requires death, death to self, death to your own inclinations, death to self-ambition, death to your own way, you've got to employ and trust God for the economy of grace. Because there are some things you cannot do, but grace can. When you cannot, grace can. Tell your neighbor, when you cannot, grace can. In celebrating the Lord's death today, we celebrate the grace of God. For we are what we are by grace, and we work, yet not us, but by the grace of God. The text says, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 says, For the suffering of, je of death, Jesus was crowned with glory and honor. With every death process, there is an associated honoring process. With every death dimension, there is an associated glory dimension. And you never ever come into glory and honor until you've learned how to suffer in death. And Jesus typifies this more than anybody else. For the suffering of death, he's crowned with glory and, and honor. I want to allude to that in a moment because it has much to do with his status as Lord. Everyone say he's Lord, right? He's crowned with glory and honor, and he is Lord. In Hebrews chapter 2, the same chapter, verse 14, it says, Therefore, since children share in flesh and blood, he himself also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the, the devil. The next verse 15 says the following. And might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. One of the great things about the death of our Lord is that he used the very medium called death to break the power of him who had the power over death so that he might free men who lived life in fear of death. He met the devil at his own game, in other words. And through death, he delivered us from the fear of death, men who were subject in slavery to the fear of death all of our lives. He conquered death, he conquered hell, he conquered the grave, three different economies. Death, hell, and the grave were conquered by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now men on the earth, we don't need to live this life in fear of death because death has been conquered. Death has been overcome. So even now we confidently say, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want everyone this morning, for those that might be present, this might be a word for you. Um, do not live life in fear of dying. Right? You don't have to look at the grave in the, with the, with the, in the prospect of the grave with the element of fear resident within you. Because Christ has overcome death by his death to deliver you from the fear of death. So you live life sometimes even in the execution of the will of God, being prepared to lose your life so that purpose is achieved. The prospect of dying poses no threat to your intentions to fulfill the will of the Father. In Paul's language, he says, I don't count my life dear unto my Self, he wasn't in, living in the culture of self-preservation. Even the, in the process, if he dies doing God's will, he knows that death is not the ultimate, but he doesn't live his life in the fear of death so long as purpose is accomplished, even though the prospect of dying could be a reality. But death in and of itself mustn't pose any threat, mustn't impose any inhibition, any restriction, 
to our intent to fulfill the will of God. Bump your neighbor and say, I don't count my life dear unto myself. Just tell someone next to you, I don't count my life dear unto myself. Right? It's in the process of dying that you live. And that, that's another uh, sort of um, sermon all together. Today we glory in the fact that he died to deliver us from the fear of death. And we can live life in absolute confidence, knowing that because he conquered death, we too can overcome, and death poses no threat to us at any level in our intent to fulfill and execute the will of God. At one point, they told Paul not to go to a certain place because there, the Jews at Jerusalem will take you, bind you, and throw you into prison. The prophecy went out to this effect. The brothers were so concerned for his life, they thought he must not go. And Paul interpreted the prophecy as a reason to go, but they interpreted the prophecy as a reason not to go. And he says these words, I do not count my life dear unto myself. Because even the prospect of death doesn't feature in my world as something that will pose a significant threat to my intent to fulfill the will of God for me. So I want to encourage you to be so confident about issues relative to death because he died and he overcame death and hell. He overcame gra the grave through his death on the cross. And when we think about this, it instills a confidence in us. Everyone say confidence. I live confidently in life because if the greatest enemy, or what the Bible calls the last enemy, death, everyone say the last enemy, right? The last enemy will one day be put under the feet of the church of God. Not so? And at the second return of the Lord, at his second coming, the literal physical return of the Lord, death will be swallowed up in victory in the experience of the life of the church. That is a certainty. That is a reality. That will take place at a future point in time. And while I anticipate that, even though the prospect of dying and the reality of death is real, I just attended a funeral of a dear friend yesterday. Um, it's real, it stares us in the face. Yet, our view is that it does not hold any power over us. That even when we die, we are with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. I'm quoting Romans 14 here, right? Whether we live or die, we are the, we are the, we are the Lord. So death is not, hasn't got any sense of, finality in terms of its judgment upon those who are the sons of God. Amen. Now, what has this got to do with our subject? I want to speak to you about the Lordship of Christ. Everyone say he's Lord. And he's pre-existently Lord. He was always Lord. Did not become Lord at a point in time, that is through his death or his resurrection, but his death and resurrection actualizes aspects of his rule and his lordship in the affairs of men. Okay? Everyone say he's Lord. Now, I want to go through some scriptures. Now, because we love the word and this is a word church, we're going to pour through the scriptures. Everyone say we're going to pour. Okay? And let the scriptures speak unto us. Let the scriptures testify of their, their own accord. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3, it says the following. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord. Except by who? Come on, talk to me. Except by? Except by the Holy Spirit. 
There's nobody that has the Holy Spirit that will ever curse Jesus. No person who has the Spirit will say Jesus is accursed. In fact, Paul here is very emphatic. He says, there's no one who has the Holy Spirit that will curse Jesus. But he even says, no one can even say then, the commendation, he is Lord, except that comes by a revelation of the Holy Spirit. And the word here, when it says no one can say, that is not just to articulate it with words, oh, Jesus is Lord, because anybody can just say that. But what Paul is referring to here is having an internal revelation in your spirit that Jesus is Lord. It is part of the Holy Spirit's work, if you would, to give every son of God a fresh revelation of the Lordship of Jesus. Say this with me, he is Lord. Say this loud, Jesus is Lord. My prayer is that that does not just become a theological statement of truth that you know, something we've grown up with, Christianese. <laughs> we have terms and we have phrases. We've grown up with Jesus is Lord, etc. God is good all the time, you know. We're so adept and we're so reflexive in the things we know. And it's so routine for us to say, Jesus is Lord. But I, my heart is, this must become a revelation, more than an articulation. It must become something that is present as a reality deep within your spirit, more than its words that are simply echoed from your mouth. Because if he truly is Lord, there are certain manifestations, certain implications of the statement that must be obvious within your and my life. Say it again, Jesus is Lord. Jesus Amen. Is Lord. And I pray this morning, um, because of the brevity of time, um, I'm just going to scatter some seeds, not teach this line upon line. I'm going to throw your thoughts out that will provoke, I hope to provoke you, that you will search the scriptures further, make deeper inquiry into some of the principles that we are going to release today. Now in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 41, let's go there. Matthew 22 and verse 41. It says the following. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together. Let me just stop here. You need to read the entire chapter obviously to get context. But throughout this chapter, several questions were hurled at Jesus in the hope to entrap him. This particular question that will be hurled to him by the Pharisees would be the last one, the answer to which he would give them that would cease further questioning, right? This is the last question. His answer would literally stop the questioning process. The Pharisees were gathered together. Jesus asked them a question. So what do you think? So Jesus is asking the question, what do you think about the Christ and whose son is he? And they said to him, watch, he is the son of David. Now, let me ask you this. Is that true or false? It's true. Jesus comes from the line of? The line of David, right? Jesus is not satisfied with the accurate answer. He wants a more exact answer. He wants something more precise. Right? God is moving away from accuracy to precision, to exactness. How many of you have ever experienced sometimes when somebody asks you a question or you they, and they give the lesser right answer? <laughs> so as to not confront the real thing. So these Pharisees are clever. They know he's asked, they've asked all the questions up to this point. So he says, oh, by the way, the Christ, whose son is he? And they said, the son of David. Jesus is a master at how he answers questions. Obviously, he is the truth. So he knows how to answer difficult things. Right? He said to them, then how does David, everyone say David in the spirit. So Jesus asked them, how does David in the spirit? Now, we've just read Corinthians. Nobody 
can say Jesus is Lord except by the, by the Spirit. This is a corroborating scripture concerning David's experience with the same truth. How can then David in the Spirit call him Lord? So when did David call Jesus Lord? It's recorded for us in Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is the most oft quoted psalm in the New Testament. It's quoted more than any other psalm in the New Covenant. And so, the Lord, this is what David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If then, David, Jesus' is reasoning, if then David calls him Lord, how is he David his son? Because you guys says that the Christ is David's son. But if David himself called him Lord, how can he be his son? And nobody was able to answer him, not a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. Now let's read Psalm 110. So Jesus draws from the Old Covenant. The Old Testament scriptures are very, very relevant for us in the New Testament. And he quotes Psalm 110, where David, say this loud, say, in the Spirit. It's David in the Spirit being a prophet because the New Testament clearly identifies David as a prophet. So David prophetically is seeing something here in the spirit when he writes the psalm. So Psalm 110 says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. This is what David saw. Now, who sits at the right hand of the majesty on high? Who? Christ Jesus, not so? Come on, say Christ Jesus. <laughs> He sits at the right hand of the Father, of the majesty on high as it's sometimes called. So when David said this, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Obviously, the second Lord here is a reference to Christ Jesus. If it's the reference to Christ Jesus, who is the first Lord I reference to? The Father. The father is talking to the son, and David has a view that both the father and the son are Lord. Now repeat this after, say, both the father. Come on, I can't hear you. Say, both the father and the son are Lord. He says, the Lord said to my Lord, you will sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. Now, when did Jesus sit at the right hand of the Father? Well, he sat at the right hand of the Father after his ascension. Not so? Right? We've got the death or the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, 40 days on the earth, and then you get the ascension of Christ. When he went back into the heavens, the Bible says he sat down at the right hand of his Father. So picture this. David is living thousands of years before this event. And he's peering, he's looking into the future. And he's prophetically seeing the fact that Jesus would die. Jesus would be buried, be raised and ascend and sit at the right hand of his father on high. Now, just for those of you who are scholars, Matthew eleven twenty-five. 25, refers to the Father as Lord himself. Jesus referred to the Father as the Lord. He said, Father, Lord of heaven and all of, of earth. Not so? I want to I massage this into your spirits. Say, the Father is Lord. Father. Say, Christ the Son is Lord. We might as well complete this. Say, the Holy Spirit is Lord. <laughs> That's 2 Corinthians 3, 17. It says, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Everyone say, Christ is Lord. Christ. We'll get to that in a moment. This is very, very important for you to understand this. Now, we often 
use the phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word Lord in the Greek is kurios. Who's curious as to what to kurios means? <laughs> right? It simply just in basic terms means master or, or owner, the one who has the right and claim to possess. Everyone say, he's my master. Say, he's my owner. He has the right to lay possession or claim to possession on everything I am. Right? Whenever you use this term, Lord, you are saying, I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. Not, doesn't the Bible say that? We are not ourselves. We've been bought with the precious blood of Christ. We lose all self-determination. We die. We defer to him. He has the right to direct. He has the right to lead. He has the right to, 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 to set out our path. He has the right to impose if he wants to. He has the right to, to cause us to take specific decisions that are alien to our intent and nature. Say this with me, he's Lord. Come on, he's Lord supreme and he's Lord of all. Christ is the Greek Christos, and it means the anointed one, right? Or his anointing, right? Jesus, the term Jesus has reference to the man, the historical man, Jesus, who walked on the earth for 33 and a half years before dying. So Jesus is a reference to his humanity, right? Lordship to his supremacy, the owner, the possessor of, of everything. Then you've got this Christ dimension, the Lord, say, the, say Lord, Lord, Jesus, Jesus. Christ, Christ, right? Now part of what Christ means, and we'll get into this a bit more in a moment, anything that has reference to Christ embodies an anointing, because the word strictly translated means the anointed one. Did he not say in Luke 418? The spirit of the, everyone say the spirit of the Lord. It's the spirit of the Lord is on me for he hath anointed me to preach, etc. Right? So you have this idea of something associated usually with the Holy Spirit in the anointing. Everyone say the anointed one. Right? So he's the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus a reference to humanity. God always needs a humanity. He always needs human interface between being empowered with an anointing by the Holy Ghost and that human being submitted to the Lordship of Christ. He is the Lord Jesus Christ and in his humanity as Jesus, he demonstrated to us how to relate to his Father as Lord and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, the Lord, to empower the obedience of his actions in life. If it was true for him, it will also be true for, for you and I. Now, I know you are busy with the series on Acts, and you've just started, but if you go to Acts chapter 2, it says the following. Now, we're laying a foundation. I'll give, I'll give application to this in a moment. Acts chapter 2 verse 32 says, everyone say this Jesus. Say it like you're preaching if you are Peter. <laughs> say this Jesus. <laughs> Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. And he says this Jesus, God raised him up to which we are all witnesses, therefore having been exalted to where? Everyone say the right hand. Tell your neighbor David saw this and called him Lord, right? So Lordship has always got to do with a revelation of where you see him seated, far above all powers and principalities, all rule, all darkness, all enemies of God. Jesus is far above all of these things. Say this with me, he's Lord, right? Exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has now poured forth this which you both see 
and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself, David himself, Peter quotes Psalm 110, says, the Lord said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain, everyone say for certain. I'm letting the house of gate know for certain that God has made him what? God has made him both Lord and God has made him Christ. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the human who died in the flesh for the sins of all other humanity. And in his death on the cross, his resurrection and his ascension back into heaven, the Father has made him both Lord and Christ. Many people love the Christ dimension, but not the Lord dimension. Because when you say you are Lord, you are implying certain things about your willingness to comply and to obey very specific things that he will require of you. I hope by the time we finish here, he will still be Lord <laughs> of your life. He is Lord, no doubt, but will you embrace the fact that I want to make him the Lord of every detail of my life? Just, just for the sake of understanding, and Pastor Thalma has processed some of these thoughts in multiple schools historically. The word Christ, Christos, as I've said, the anointed one, it refers to the pre-existent being. Everyone say pre-existent being. It's a reference to the pre-existent being in which the fullness of deity vests. Say this out loud with me. Say Christ. Christ. Now don't think of Jesus Christ when I say Christ here. I'm talking about, say it again with me, say the pre-existent being that embodies the fullness of deity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah? This is very important for you to understand. In, we were taught in references in the New Testament that refer to Christ Jesus, as opposed to Jesus Christ is a reference primarily to his, his earthly life, Jesus specifically, but Jesus Christ to his life on earth. But Christ Jesus is a reference to his resurrected and ascended position, right? The man Jesus, everyone say the man Jesus. While he walked on the earth, it was a marvelous thing that God did in his wisdom. He chose a human vessel to incarnate the fullness of everything Christ, Father, Son, and Spirit would represent, but it would be showcased in a human body, yeah? Now, some of you are looking at me like, what on earth is going on? <laughs> when Jesus said, for example, who do men say on earth that I, the son of man, am? I'm quoting Matthew 16. They said it's one of the prophets. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you are Elijah. Peter, by revelation, everyone say revelation. That's why the eyes of your understanding need to be enlightened. There are some things you can only get not by being informed by, by the thing being revealed. It's not information, this. It must take place by revelation. So Jesus, Peter said, you are what? It, Peter did not say to him, you are Jesus, the son of God, right? He, he, looked, past the G, he looked past the humanity of the man and he said to him, you are the Christ, comma, Tell your neighbor there's a comma there. <laughs> Son of the living God. Right? What Peter saw was the fullness of deity, bodily residence in a human vessel called Jesus. But he looked beyond the humanity and he saw Father, Son, and Spirit present. So the principle is this. Why on earth then did he say Son of after that? The living God. You see, sonship. Everyone say sonship. Sonship is the only medium, is the only container, is the only vessel that has got the possibilities of fully containing Father, Son, and Spirit. So in his humanity, in an earth-based context, to bring all of heaven 
Heaven came down to us, we sang a few moments ago. To bring that dimension to us, he showcases it in a body, right? This is also in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, if you want to read it or take notes. Colossians 2, verse 9 teaches, for in Christ, for in him, dwells the fullness of the Godhead in, in bodily form, corporeally. The, the, the entirety of all that God is comes to live in this body called Jesus. This is very important for us to understand because I really believe that whenever we reference him, we draw upon his capacity to fully represent all of deity. There's one mediator, everyone say one mediator, between God and man, the man, everyone say the man, Christ Jesus. There's an eternal humanity in deity. It's the man, Christ Jesus, that is there, that is showcasing everything in sonship, all that God, Father, Son, and Spirit represent to us. So when we think of the Lordship, now say this with me, the Lordship of Christ. Yes, I'm referencing the Lordship of the Father. Yes, I'm referencing the Lordship of the Son. Yes, I'm referencing the Lordship of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Everyone say they are all Lord. But we are humans on this earth, and in our humanity, he say Jesus Christ saved us in his death on the cross. And a lot of our engagements with deity are in and through the Son, not so? It's through the medium of the Son that we, we experience all of deity. In fact, the Holy Spirit is given to us as the executor of the kingdom, and he brings to us Father and Son, and we in our sonship dynamic. Um, very often relate to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in ratifying him as Lord today, we are addressing and referencing the entirety of all deity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Say this out loud with me. Christ is Lord. Christ is Come on, say it by revelation. Christ is Lord. Christ is Lord. Now, here are some of the implications of that statement. What are then are the implications of the Lordship of Christ in our lives? Time will not permit me to go through all the scriptures here, but one of the first things that you must receive, experience, actualize, is that he must be your personal Lord. He is not happy to be the cosmic Lord, Lord of every, of the universe, he wants to be your Lord. Ask your neighbor, is Jesus your Lord? Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says this. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord. And I like the way the NASB frames it. Romans 10, verse 9. Everyone say, Jesus as Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart the person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in, sal in salvation. Now I want to encourage us all, there might be some present here, and you're in this meeting, you sung the songs, but you've got no active relationship with Jesus Christ. But you've come to a Good Friday morning service at church, and you haven't yet surrendered your life to Christ. I will invite you to seriously consider to do that and to bow your heart before him and make him the Lord of your life. This meeting will mean nothing to you if we talk about all these concepts, but you've got no personal subjective experience with him in your personal life as him being the Lord of your life. And if that is you towards the end of this, this teaching, we will, we will pray and invite you into the kingdom because your presence here is no coincidence. God brought you here because God wants to make himself the Lord of your personal life, right? He rules the entirety of the universe, but he wants to become your master, your owner, your possessor. Now, 
in John 20 and verse 28. Thomas, everyone say doubting Thomas. You know doubting Thomas? How many Thomases do we have in the meeting this morning? <laughs> Jesus rose from the dead. He had empirical evidence of corroborating the fact of his resurrection, the nail-pierced hands, the side-pierced, etc. Um, and Thomas was told by the others that they'd seen the Lord, they've seen his body, and Thomas still doubted. So in John 20, after Jesus showing his wounds to Thomas, Thomas, John 20, verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, said out loud, because watch this, do you know what an exclamation mark in English grammatical usage means? What does it mean? Come on, talk to me. What does it mean? It's loud. It's voluminous. So picture the scene, right? Jesus shows him the evidence. And this guy breaks out with a revelation. Now let's say it. One, two, three. My Lord and my God. This is Thomas. He does not say my God first. He says, my Lord first, right? People love that God dimension in God, but they don't want the Lord dimension in God. He is the Lord God in scripture. He is the Lord God Almighty. He's never the God Lord. Nowhere in the Bible you find that framing. It's always Lord first. Everyone say Lord first, right? And I'm telling you, if you want everything that God is, submit to his Lordship, and you'll get his godness pulsating in and through your life like you can't, can't believe. You know, I've been addressing him a lot in my private prayer recently as Lord, not just my God. If I say to him, Father, I come to you in the name of your precious son, Jesus, my Lord. Father, you're my Lord. By the Spirit, we is Lord as well. Tell someone, Christ is Lord. Amen? So, I just feel, I'm just some prophetic impressions as we go along. The doubts of Thomas were silenced by the presentation of physical evidence. And the physical evidence unveiled to Thomas's mind exactly who he was dealing with, that this is the Lord. I feel prophetically that some of you have been doubting certain aspects of what God is leading you into. And there's a hesitancy and a reticence concerning a forward movement into something. You are here in the Good Friday service this morning and the Lord is saying this to you, go for it. Some of you can leave the building now and go home, that's your word. <laughs> God is saying stop doubting, stop doubting because your revelation of me as Lord will give a serenity and a peace to you that no matter how problematic the path ahead might seem, that he's not just Lord of your life personally, he's Lord of the cosmos. He's Lord of processes. He's Lord of purposes. He's Lord of all. I don't have time to lay this out from various scriptures. He is Lord of every single detail of your life. And that just might be for someone that is present here today. Stop doubting because I believe your presence in the meeting today has given to you a revelation of Christ as Lord and has given you confidence to now boldly proceed the path ahead into that which God is leading you into. Another implication of Lordship is that he has the right to direct every detail and every path of my life. If he is Lord, he must be Lord of all, or he does not want to be Lord at all. You cannot compartmentalize your life into sections and say, you can have sway over this area, God, but don't touch that area. I bend to you and bow to your Lordship here, but not in my finances or not in my relationships. I want to encourage us all. The Lordship of Christ must be all pervasive. 
It must cover every single detail of your life. He wants to be Lord of every single thing. Now let me just read one or two scriptures here in reference to this. The classic we just read, Romans chapter 14 and verse 7 says, Not one of us lives for himself. Not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for who? Come on, say that out. If we live, we live for who? Say, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for? We die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or whether we die, we are the? We are the Lord's. I've come to the place in my life where um, I'm now prepared to surrender everything at the command of my master, my curios, my owner. I don't own nothing of myself. I don't possess nothing. You mustn't just tell me to give my wife away. That one I'll keep. <laughs> but I can divest of anything, ambition, plans, purposes. Right? I'm living, I'm learning how to live lightly so that God can easily maneuver me. Right? And I'm saying, if you are Lord, then direct affairs. I don't count my life dear unto myself. I don't live for myself. I'm living, but I live unto the Lord. If I die in the process, it's for the Lord. Be like Esther. Remember Esther, what she said? When she was asked to go to the king, and it wasn't protocol to come to the king unsummoned, right? She said, I will go, after Mordecai prodded her. She says, and if I perish, I perish but go I will. Her mindset was, I would rather be obedient or I would rather die in the process of obedience than to live and preserve my life in a culture of disobedience. For her death is not a, a factor that would have prevented a pursuit of the path to obedience. The Bible says concerning Christ, Jesus himself, Philippians 2, let's read it because of it's Good Friday, I think. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. How does one become obedient? Oh, not just plain obedience. How does one become obedient to the point of dying while obeying? Everyone say he humbled himself. You see, whenever you reference him as Lord, your pride must go. Pride is the biggest factor that repels the grace of God. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the, he gives grace to the humble. Obedience to the point of death is impossible without humility. Because he first humbles himself, then he obeys to the point of death. And what does God give to the humble? Grace. So in the process of humility, grace befits the Son of God. And he is able to do the impossible by human accounts, willingly suffer at the hands of Romans, being crucified for the sin of humanity. He did all of this by grace because of, of his humility. Then the text says, verse 10, for this reason. Everyone say, for this reason. It's like, let me just, let's just read it and I'll make a point. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name. Everyone say the name. Which is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and those who are on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the, the Father. This all brings glory ultimately to God the, the Father. There is no death process while obeying God, you prepare to die, for which God will not also highly exalt you, like he did his son. God is a rewarder of obedience. He's a rewarder of obedience. And I want to encourage us all, whatever he asks you, do it. Whatever he tells you, do it. In humility, 
put your ideas aside and say, well, if you are really my Lord, this issue, and I can't get away from specific issues that God might be laying heavily on some of your hearts. Everyone say this issue. Now bump, turn your neighbor and say, you know what issue he's talking about. I don't know what's going on in your heart, in your life. I don't know what's going on with you. I'm just hearing in my spirit saying that specific thing must bow to the Lordship of Christ. Because we are too big-headed sometimes. <laughs> too highly opinionated. And we hold fast to doggedly, to specific mindsets, opinions, and ideas. And we refuse to bow them to the Lordship of Christ. That must stop, brethren. If he is Lord, then make him Lord, truly. And allow him to direct your affairs. You must obey in humility to the point of death. I know nobody who obeys God to the point of death that is not rewarded. God will reward you. There will be an exaltation like as was true with the Son of God. There will be a reward for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Just quickly. Okay, let me leave out a few things because of time. But just quickly, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2 says the following. Now, how many know this, that when he died, we died? Yes? Come on, talk to me. When he died, we died. Yes? Right? When he was buried, we were buried. Yes? When he rose, we rose. Yes? When he ascended, we ascended. Yes? Where are we seated now? In high places? Where? In Christ. In heavenly places. Not so? That's our positional reality, right? And Colossians says this, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. Right? We have too many earthly Christians. Now, don't get me wrong. You mustn't be so heavenly minded that you have no earthly good. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But in large respect, too many sons of God are influenced by the culture of this world, by thought patterns that prevail in this earth. Yet we must draw our mindsets from heaven, from things above, because there is where we are seated. And we must accord greater priority to kingdom realities, to kingdom priorities, and not things of this world. Soccer will pass away, <laughs> Dr. Segi. <laughs> but the word of the Lord will endure forever. <laughs> Golf will pass away. Um, I'm not decrying sports. I know I, I love sport myself. I, I work out regularly, as you can tell. <laughs> I'm just joking. Right? I, love, I love all of these things, but I will never go to the gym as regularly as I do though to the point where it becomes idolatrous in my life and to the point where it takes away time that I should be spending in kingdom things. Right? Sam Solon said once, exercise enough for as it is necessary enough to do God's will in your body. In other words, be, be fit reasonably, right? I don't know why we're talking about that, but in any case, <laughs> this might be for, for some of you. Get some gym junkies, yeah? It, it might not be sport. Listen carefully. It could be any idolatrous thing, anything that subverts the supremacy and the place of the Lord in your, in your life. Now, because of time, I want to get to something very specific. And I'll just quote the references here without reading them. You can take note. In Acts 19, the, Acts 9, sorry, verse 9, verse 10 to 16. There was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Yeah, I am Lord. So God comes to Ananias, Acts 9, verse 10. And God says to Ananias, Ananias, and he's referring reflexive inclination to address God is by using the name Lord. Yeah, I am. Now say that with me. Say, yeah, I am Lord. Yeah. 
The moment Ananias, because he knows what he's saying, he's saying, whatever you ask me, name it, Lord, I'm willing. Because I'm addressing you as the one who owns me, my master, my curios, the determinator, the director of my life. I'm entirely submitted to every command of yours. Here I am, Lord. By the way, Abraham said something similar when God tested him. God called him Abraham, and he said, here I am, Lord, right? The I am, that I am, is God, not so Jehovah, Yahweh. When humans say things like, here I am, it's a cry that everything the I am that I am is must now showcase itself in human flesh. As you are, so I am. I in this world, okay? And he says, here I am. Long story short, God tells him, this guy that used to kill Christians, Saul of Tarsus, is now my son, I'm paraphrasing. Go to the street called Straight, you'll find him there, lay your hands upon him, you might receive the Holy Ghost and receive recovery from his blindness. Do you know the story? And then suddenly, the reality hits Ananias, sure. And he had some misgivings about going. Remember? He says, Lord, haven't you read CNN recently? Or aren't you up to speed with current affairs? This guy is a persecutor of the church. Right? This guy is a persecutor of the church. Let me read it. Ananias said to him, Lord. Now, I like the way he starts, though. <laughs> Everyone say, Lord. Lord. I have heard many th things from many about this man. How much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. The subtext is here, am I next? Right? <laughs> now, you know, let's just read for, 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 for the sake of completing this. Lord, I've heard from this man how many things he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And he has authority from chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, everyone say the Lord said to him. The text could have said God said or Jesus there's constant reference here to the lordship of the one who is addressing him. The Lord said to him, go. Everyone say go. go. That might be a word for some of you. He's a chosen vessel, etc. Right? So I want to encourage you here. Although there might be specific, real challenges associated with the path God is leading you on, and your reasons are justifiable, Right? In fact, some of you have what I call ready responses in your arsenal as to why you should not obey God in the specific matter he's leading you. You have a pre-prepared response. And it's rational, it's justifiable, it's arguable, it makes sense from a human perspective. And yet God is saying, set that aside and just obey me. And do not be worried about, about putting yourself at risk in the process, for I will be with you. If I'm truly your Lord, are you then willing to become obedient even to the prospect of death in this case? And you know the story, Ananias obeyed God. Right? The fact that he starts his retort with, Lord, indicates to me that even though he's going to argue with the Lord almost that I have some justifiable reasons, yet my address to you as my Lord, I'm already prepared to set those things aside simply to obey you. Right? Obedience to the point of, of death. In Acts chapter 9, in the very next chapter, when Paul deals with, sorry, the, the same chapter, earlier in the chapter, when Paul first confronts Saul of Tarsus, strikes him off his high horse, remember? Literally and physically, right? Blinded. There's a vision from heaven. Acts 9 verse 4. He fell to the ground and he heard the voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, what did he say? Now notice even the great scholar trained under Gamaliel, the Pharisee of Pharisee, uh, Hebrew of the Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin, knows the law very, very well. 
he realizes something is happening here that is outside the scope of my theological world. And his first sort of inclination to address the being that is speaking to him is to ask, who are you, Lord? Notice the different responses between him and Ananias. Ananias' first response is, yeah, I am Lord, because Saul doesn't really know him in a personal sense. Saul's first question is, who are you, Lord? I think internally he knows this is God. But Paul kicks off his relationship with the Lord by addressing him as Lord. A sign to me that this apostle will suffer greatly at the purpose of the Lord and do anything. And so Jesus responds, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. In Acts 22, when Paul gives the same account to the Sanhedrin, Acts 22 verse 10, Paul lays out how the Lord met him and he asked this question, who are Lord? But Paul adds another question that's not in Acts 9. You'll find this in Acts 22. And Paul says, Acts 22, verse 10, I said, what shall I do who? Come on, say it out loud. With me. Say, what shall I do, Lord? Paul is, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go into Damascus. There you will find, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. You see, your first encounter with the Lordship of Christ, firstly, you've you got to know the Lord. Everyone say, know the Lord. So Paul cannot do for the Lord. What would you have me to do? Notice the order of his questions. Who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do, Lord? Right? Many will come to me in that day, Jesus would say, and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do many works in your name? And he would say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity or lawlessness. The word lawlessness, anomia, literally means those without law, those who practice do not practice principles. You did a lot for me without knowing me. I did not know you, but you were highly active. Paul's imperative is, first, who are you? Let me get to know you. And what do I need to do for you? One of the implications of lordship is this. Anyone who has a revelation of the lordship of Christ will be a very busy person. You cannot have a revelation of the Lordship of Christ and be lazy. You cannot have a Lordship of the person of Christ and be passive. You cannot have a revelation of the Lordship of Christ and live in a culture of postponement and deferment. Paul's heart is, who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do, Lord? And I feel that some of you yeah, need to be activated into purpose. You need to get off your blessed assurance. <laughs> <laughs> and activate. Everyone say activate. activate. Right? You know, in, in defending the resurrection for 53, 57 verses in 1 Corinthians 15, this is how Paul ends the whole chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be he steadfast, immovable, always abounding in what? Of the work of who? Say the work of the Lord. I mean, the implications of death and resurrection. The apostles spent 57 verses talking about resurrection in this chapter. And this is how he concludes it. He said, if that's the reality, if we have a living hope, that we, if he lives, we will live too in a glorified body. He says, therefore. Now, whenever therefore is in the Bible, always ask yourself, what is it therefore? Right? It's the conclusory statement. Because sometimes you can know great doctrines, theoretically, but no practical outworking. If I know Jesus as my Lord, if I know Father as my Lord, the Spirit as Lord, there's going to be certain outworkings in my life. And one of it is, I will abound in the work of the Lord. I'll be like, Paul, who are you, Lord? And what on earth must I do, Lord? Right? 
Just tell your neighbor, if you haven't noticed, you're getting older. <laughs> we don't have much time. I buried my friend yesterday, 60 years old, heart attack, great minister of God. And I sat there in the field, I said, God, what about the latter part of my life? What about the days ahead of me? And literally in my heart, my cry is, what would you have me to do, my Lord? I'm willing to do anything so as to please you, my Lord, and as my master. Just one last scripture, then we'll close. Second Corinthians 3 and verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is you know, most Christians, when they quote this verse, only quote the latter part. How many know the latter part? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But you can't quote half the scripture. The full scripture is, now the Lord is the, is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there you find liberty. Is the Spirit of the Lord everywhere? Yes. David said, where can I run from your, even if I make my bed in hell, I'll find your spirit there. The spirit has never left the earth. He's everywhere, but there's not liberty everywhere. But the text says where the spirit is, there is liberty. The truth is that it's only where the spirit is Lord, where he is, will you find liberty. There's no liberty without lordship. Liberty is breakthrough. Everyone say breakthrough. Liberty is setting free, overcoming. And the Spirit wants to do that in your life. But He will not bring the liberty until He is ratified as Lord. And He, the Spirit, according to, to John's gospel, brings both Father and Son to us. You'll get the Lordship of the entire deity at work within your life. Uh, a very powerful Lord, one that's above powers and princes. Palities, far above all rule and authority, did not Jesus say, there he is seated? Right? And if he conquered death, the most powerful enemy known to man, what is that thing you are dealing with? That the same Lord cannot sort out. He wants to bring liberty, but he will only bring liberty there where he is Lord. Uh, Joshua, before he confronted Jericho, not so. Remember, they were cir he circumcised the entire camp at Gilgal. You know the story. It's called John, uh, Joshua chapter five. I have it in my notes somewhere. Joshua five, verse thirteen and fourteen. Let's read it. This will be our last scripture. My church laugh at me when I say that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So it came about when Joshua was by Jericho. And he lifted up his eyes, and he, and he looked. Behold, a man was standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. Many commentators believe this to be Michael, the archangel, the angel of war. Right? Or it could be an epiphany of the Lord himself. Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? Tell your neighbor a very, very good question. <laughs> Okay, you're about to take the most impenetrable city, right? How, how, does, how does it say, now Jericho was tightly shut up? Remember that text? No one could go in or out. Thick walls. Chariots could race side by side on these walls. Impenetrable fortress. He's dealing with this first assignment of his. And he has this vision and this angelic being appears to him. So he's a man of war, Joshua is. And he asks the angel, have you come to fight for us or fight against us? Are you with me or are you with my enemies? And look at the answer, crazy answer he's given. No. <laughs> How is that for an answer? Say no. <laughs> I would have expect, yes, Joshua, I'm with you. But the answer is like neutral. 
No. Are you with us? If you ask somebody, are you with me or against me? And the person says, no. <laughs> you haven't really answered the question, right? Right, the angel says, no, rather, I indeed come now as the captain of the hosts of the Lord. Everyone says, Lord of hosts. Lord. Pastor Thamo taught us, host is the Hebrew, Saba, T-S-A-B-A. Everyone say, Saba. And host refers to um, the arrangement of angels and multiple resources that are arrayed in military precision to serve in servitude the purposes of God in the sons of God. Right? Everyone say military precision. You get the host of heaven. But you know Genesis 2 says that when God finished created the heavens and the earth and their hosts. Everyone say and their hosts. So there are hosts of earth and there are hosts of heaven. Not so? There's hosts of heaven and earth. Not so? And if the host carries every resource arrayed in military precision that you, the son of God, will need to execute your purpose, we need the host, not so? We need the resource and the arsenal of everything heaven is. And I just sense when Pastor Chris read Isaiah 54, there was a reference in that verse there to the Lord of hosts. And I felt, this is a word for this house, I felt there's an angel a sign for the next phase of the purposes of God here. And that which is tightly shut up will be opened. That which seems impenetrable, impregnable, that which seems will not be overcome, will be overcome because God has not just sent you any supportive dimension. He sent to you his dynamic as Lord of the hosts of heaven. Everyone say every resource. So if you read the text, let's just finish this off. No, rather I indeed come as the captain of the hosts of the Lord. And Joshua fell to his feet to the earth and he bowed down and he said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Doesn't this sound similar to Paul? What must I do, Lord? The angel is saying, I'm not for you, neither am I against you. You decide. The angel is leaving it up to Joshua. I have come with arsenal. I've come with heavenly backing. I have come as the captain of the host of the Lord. I'm neither for you nor against you. You decide. If you make a decision to take, if you read the next verse, he takes his sandal off his feet for the place on which he stands is holy ground, and sandals speak about purpose, the desire to fulfill purpose. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What Joshua is saying is, I divest myself of my own purpose, my own way, and I choose the purposes of the Lord in this instance. The angel is saying to him, if you are for God's purpose, I'll be, I'll be for you. But if you are against God's purpose, I have come against you. But if you are for the purposes of the Lord, I will support every initiative of your being. And the humility of Joshua, his compliance, his obedience is, what must I do? What would you have me to do, Lord? And the rest is history, as you know. I want to encourage us all this morning on this Good Friday. He, the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, broke the power of death, hell, and the grave. And he rose on the third day and he ascended after 40 days back to his father in heaven. He's now seated above all rule, power, and authority. Everyone say all power. He said this in Matthew 28. All power and authority has been given to me. And the Holy Ghost wants to take everything the Father has given to the Son and make it known to us, his sons. Right? This great liberty coming I foresee. There's great breakthroughs coming, I foresee. There's great procurement coming, I foresee. You're gonna secure much in the respect to God's purposes. But the Lord will go before you. No wonder David said to Goliath, you come to me with spear and sword, but who do I come to you with? I come to you in the name of the 
I come to you in the name of the Lord, right? If you are faithful in your tithes and offerings, it's the Lord of hosts that rebukes the devourer. And then the whole arsenal comes, you just factor your obedience in, you activate something. But he will not be Lord of hosts in you until he's Lord of your heart, until he's Lord of your home. Make him Lord of your heart, make him Lord of your home. You activate him as Lord of hosts. Right? There's an arsenal, there's a resource that he wants to give. The spirit is Lord, there where he is, liberty and breakthrough comes. Second Samuel 5, David said this, when the Philistines surround him, he asked God, shall I, shall I attack them? God says, yes. And he positioned the army. You know this very well, right? And the Lord sovereignly gave David mighty victory. You know what David said? The Lord has broken through my enemies like the breakthrough of waters. And he called the name Baal Perizim of that place. And Baal Perizim means Lord of the breakthrough. Who needs a breakthrough? You see, you can't have breakthrough without the Lord dimension. When David realized I have stacked insurmountable odds stacked up against me here, I need a breakthrough. I need the sovereign Lord of hosts to come through. And God did that, right? And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies like the breakthrough of many Waters, who knows the power of water? We in case it didn't know it very well. <laughs> I've seen water do strange things, great damage. Water will find every crevice and neutralize the most impregnable stronghold. Right? And David said, when I look at how he dealt with the Philistines, the Lord has broken through my enemies, like the sound of many waters, like the breakthrough of many waters. And waters is the word of God, as you know. You bring your life in obedience to God's word, you're gonna activate Lord of the breakthrough. That's what David called him. You're Lord, not just of my heart. You're even Lord of my breakthroughs. Tell your neighbor he's Lord of the breakthrough. I wonder if the team can join me up here. You know, he's even Lord of the harvest. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would raise up laborers. I want you all to stand. I want us to be like Thomas this morning and say, my God, or my Lord, and my, and my God. Great is the Lord. I want you to take a moment before we leave and open up your hearts to Him, to magnify Him. Amen. Can we do that? Just lift up your hands. Great. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. The city of our God, the holy place. The joy of the whole earth. Just lift your hands and great is the Lord. Is the Lord in whom we have the victory? He aids us, He aids us against the enemy. Come on, we bow down on our knees. We bow down on our knees. Come on, lift your voice, Lord. We want to lift up your name. And Lord, we want to lift your, your name on high. And Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives. And Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone are God eternal. 
trusting your unfailing love. For you alone, for you alone are God eternal. The city of our God, the holy place, the joy of the We bow down. We bow down on our knees. Lord, Lord, we want to lift your, your name, name on high. Oh, we want to thank you. Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives. to him, the sovereign king, Lord of the heavens, Lord of the earth, Lord of my heart, Lord of my home. We lift up holy hands without wrath or doubt, and we come boldly to your throne of grace, loving Father, Lord of heaven and earth, Jehovah Adonai. We bless you. Like you came to Moses and you declared your name to him, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassion, full of mercy and loving kindness. We thank you for these dimensions within your Lordship that we come to appeal to even now. Thank you that you are merciful. Thank you that you are gracious. And we ask for your forgiveness every time we said, Lord, but we lived differently. We did not own up to that which we proclaim by our lifestyles, our thinking. Forgive us, Lord. And Lord, today we make a new commitment. We ask first that you give us a new revelation of your being as master, as possessor as our Lord. And what would you have us to do, Lord? What would you have me to do, Lord? What would you have my family to do, Lord? What would you have my spouse and I to do? What would you have my children to do? Lord, what would you have us as a ministry to do? We are at your beck and call We lay our lives down afresh at the altar. You who overcame death, 
hell and the grave for us. We draw great comfort and consolation and encouragement from your pattern of obedience. And today we want to come into that same grace dimension of being obedient even unto death. In humility we do come. And I pray that you would impart even now, lift up your hands, even now great grace to the humble. Great grace to those of us that have set aside prideful mentalities, opinions. We set those things aside in humility. And we bow before the sovereign ruler of the universe, Lord of the heavens, Lord of the earth. And I know, O oh God, that your dimension as Lord of hosts will come to this congregation. And everyone listening, I pray in the name of Jesus. I thank you that you are positioned to resource every single one of us significantly. You are with us because of our disposition. And I pray, oh God, this dimension of Lord of breakthroughs will manifest itself in the lives of your people with significant results, I pray. I thank you, oh God, that things will happen effortlessly. I thank you, oh God, that things will happen seamlessly, facilitatedly. And it will be the Lord at work in and through it all. Now we want to be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. As his hands are lifted up, I pray the strength of the Lord himself will be our portion. And that we would lead lives of tremendous liberty and breakthrough. We declare to you, Holy Spirit, that you are Lord. And wherever you are Lord, there is liberty. We declare liberty, breakthroughs in every life, in every relationship. I pray where there's been impasses, that things will break through, will be broken down, and people will walk effortlessly into that which you have for them. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Randolph. The angel of the Lord has spoken. You know, one of the great laments of the Christian faith is that God is sovereignly Lord over all things, but regrettably not Lord of every life. One of the greatest and saddest exhibits of the lack of Lordship in the church is the defeated lives of so many people. And while we say He is Lord over all things, yet in our lives, he has so little possession. But my prayer today is that in this house, we will demonstrate the masterly workings of the Lord in every facet of our lives. So take this communion items out. The Lord has spoken to us today, spoken to us. Come on, some of us now need to break out. We have to break through. We have to break into the things of God. So I ask you today to, to make a devotion to the Lord Yem, that you are not just, as Randolph said, the cosmic Lord, but you're the Lord of my life, my life, sovereign, supreme, my life. Amen, you believe that? Lift your hearts to the Lord. Father, you have finished the work. You said it is finished. Yet in many of our lives, it's still unfinished. You said that you've acquired the victories, yet in our lives, we still struggle to see victory. You said that you've given us everything in the covenant, yet in our lives, we still struggle to see that covenant work. But today, we, as we've heard, make you Lord of our lives. Lord of my life, my life, my life, my life. And as we eat and drink today, Father, we are again affirming our belief in, your, in the covenant that was sealed in your blood. It gave us life, gave us every sustenance we need to be triumphant. We bless you now as we eat and drink in Jesus' name. Go ahead, partake.